In the beginning, there was monophonic sound. Folks would huddle around a single radio speaker in their living rooms or press a transistor radio speaker up to their ears while sipping on Ovaltine and munching on Unita biscuits. And they liked it. And we liked it. We loved it. Hallelujah. I'm a bold freak. Oh, happy day. But the vast majority of humans have two ears. And engineers started experimenting with ways to deliver discrete sound across two speakers to account for this physiology. After a few fits and starts, the first mass-produced stereo LPs went to market in the late 1950s. And by the late 1960s, the transition to the stereo LP was more or less complete. And it was good. And there was much rejoicing. And there was much rejoicing. Except that two-eared humans perceive sounds directionally. And while this can be somewhat addressed using clever stereo recording techniques, specific two-speaker placement, and carefully treated room acoustics, it's not the same as having discrete sound coming from more than two speakers. And also, you know, record companies and hi-fi manufacturers saw dollar signs in their eyes for yet another way to get consumers to spend money on new LPs and new gear. So, they enlisted their top engineers to figure out the best way to deliver four channels of sound. That's right quadraphonic sound to the masses. But there was no collaboration between these engineers, leading to numerous incompatible formats and significant confusion among consumers. Early quad hardware was crude and led to results that simply weren't very good. Some later hardware was better, but expensive and finicky, requiring significant calibration in order to work properly. And let's be honest, the average person doesn't give a crap about multiple sound channels. Uh, you know, back in the pre-COVID days, I used to regularly take public transportation and see college students hand off one earbud to a friend so that they could both listen to the same song at the same time. Sad and so friggin' gross. Please don't ever do that. In this video, I'll explore the three best-known quadraphonic formats, SQ, QS, and CD4. I'll tell you a little bit about how they work, maybe a lot about how they work, uh, what to look for if you're shopping for quad records, and how to decode their four-channel goodness here in the 2020s, and help you figure out if it's worth your time to even bother with it. And yes, I'm aware that the Vinyl Eyes YouTube channel did a quick video on quad back in 2020. Uh, my video will be a little bit different as it will come from the perspective of someone who owns a couple hundred quad records and has multiple hardware quad decoders slash demodulators and has experience with decoding quad using specialized software as well. Before we get started, please give a love tap to the subscribe button and bell icons below. Gently pat their little bottoms with your mouse or with your index finger if you're on one of them newfangled touchscreens that I've heard so much about. It really does help out the channel. Thank you. In the meantime, my name is Jeff. Hi, Jeff. And I am a music addict. But enough about me. This is Quadraphonic Sound. Both the SQ and QS quadraphonic systems and yes, two competing formats use the same two letters in opposite order of one another. He used a process of encoding four channels of sound onto a standard two-channel, i.e. stereo, LP. They both took advantage of phase shifting. Uh, a quick example, here's a sine wave with no phase shift, i.e. zero degrees of phase shift. Here's that same sine wave phase shifted 90 degrees. And here's the same sine wave phase shifted 180 degrees. Did you hear a difference? No, of course not, because in isolation they're all going to sound the same. So, by adding specific amounts of phase shifted and non phase shifted rear channel sound to the front channel sound, engineers discovered that you could essentially hide four channels of sound within two channels. Now, before you lovely audiophiles start slamming me in the comments, yes, this is a simplification of what's going on, and yes, there are limitations to how well this works. Mix engineers had to create their four-channel mixes very carefully or else sounds positioned in certain speakers would disappear partially or even completely when encoded. Uh, acknowledged. Now, can't we all just get along? Hey guys, Future Jeff here. Uh, I'm in the process of editing this video and I really didn't like my explanation on why mix engineers had to be careful. So I just wanted to interject here. Uh, the QS and SQ quad formats, the way that they work, and we'll get into them in, in very specific detail in, in a little bit. 
Um, but what would happen is it would create certain nodes or, or dead spots in the mix, where if a mix engineer tried to pan sound to one of those nodes, uh, it would completely cancel out and, and disappear in the mix. So as a result, you would find that uh, mix engineers would, uh, you know, in order to, to be careful, um, they'd sometimes be a little bit too careful, uh, and they would just pan stuff hard left in the rears and hard right in the rears. So generally, the, the front speakers, they would pan them more or less freely. Uh, but for, for example, I was just listening to, uh, to, to this the other day, and, and as you'll find out, this is one of my favorites. Uh, but I was really noticing that in the rear speakers, uh, everything was kind of panned hard, rear left and rear right. And that's the mix engineer just kind of being careful to uh, avoid those dead spots. Anyway, back to the show. The SQ system encoded things using the following formula. Oh, did I mention there would be math? Be because there's math. I'm afraid we need to use math. The encoded left channel, i.e. the left channel that ends up on your SQ quad record, is obtained by taking the left front signal, adding 70% of the right rear signal, and subtracting 70% of the left rears, phase shifted 90 degrees. The encoded right channel was obtained similarly. Take the right front signal, subtract 70% of the left rear signal, and add 70% of the right rear signal, phase shifted 90 degrees as well. By the way, when I say subtract, I really mean to add a 180 degree phase shifted version of the signal. After you've done all this, you can then theoretically get back your original four channels using a circuit that filters your audio based upon these four equations. The QS quadraphonic system, also known as regular matrix, used a slightly more complicated set of equations, although conceptually is very similar. Let me see if I can explain the encoding in a single breath. <gasps> to encode the left channel, take 92% of your left front signal, add 38% of your right front signal, add 92% of the left rear signal, phase shift in 90 degrees, and add 38% of the right rear signal, also phase shift in 90 degrees. To encode the rear channel, take 92% of your right front signal, add 38% of the left front signal, subtract 92% of the right rear channel, phase shift in 90 degrees, and subtract 38% of the left rear signal, also phase shift in 90 degrees. <sighs> To decode back to four channels, you then need a circuit that will filter your audio based upon this formula. Those are some of the super gory details. Here's, here's some of the more practical stuff for you. You need some kind of a decoder in order to play back either SQ or QS quadraphonic material. Uh, historically, this would have always been some kind of piece of hardware. Uh, the earliest SQ decoders were, for lack of a better way to put it, dumb and only offered three decibels of separation between the front and rear channels. It's noticeable, but barely. Uh, more intelligent logic-based decoders came along over the next few years, and they certainly sounded better, but they were priced accordingly. Uh, for example, the Sony SQD2020 from 1972 had a list price of $299, or just a tick under $2,000 adjusted for inflation. The best of the vintage bunch, the Fosgate Tate II from 1983, uh, well after Quad was dead and buried by the way, had a list price of $499, or just a hair under $1,400 US dollars in today's money. These days, expect to pay somewhere between $200 to $300 for the Sony, and between $500 to $600 for the Tate. Now similarly, for a good vintage QS decoder like the Sansui QSD1, expect to pay in a similar ballpark, one sold recently on eBay for about $330. There are dozens of options out there for vintage SQ and QS decoders, so be prepared to do some research before you make the leap to purchase one. The best place for researching is probably uh, quadraphonicquad.com, a very nice community for discussing all things for speaker and beyond. Believe it or not, there is a modern hardware option for both QS and SQ quadraphonic decoding, the Involve Audio Surround Master. Now, I personally have their first generation model, and I absolutely love mine. Now, some members of the always super pleasant audiophile community may disagree with me, so please just take this as one man's opinion, but I absolutely love mine. Now, once you have a quad decoder, how do you actually use it? Well, if your turntable has a built-in phono preamp, then just run the outputs from your turntable directly to the inputs of your decoder. Done. Uh, if your turntable needs an external preamp, then run the outputs of your turntable to the preamp, and then run the preamp's output to the decoder. Either way, you do not need a special turntable or stylus for SQ or QS quad. It'll certainly help if you have good quality gear, but really it'll work just fine with low-end equipment. 
Now from there, take the outputs from the decoder and run them into the multi-channel inputs on your receiver. Yeah, so right, about that. You need a receiver. And it can't just be any receiver. It has to be one with multi-channel analog inputs. That is, discrete inputs for left front, right front, left rear, and right rear channels. And chances are if it has those, it'll have center and subwoofer channel inputs as well. See, the problem is that once HDMI became a ubiquitous standard for home device connectivity, most manufacturers just stopped putting multi-channel analog inputs on their receivers. So check very carefully before purchasing anything. Uh, with my Surround Master, I use its standard four-channel outputs, and then I also use its subwoofer output to get a synthesized low-end channel for my sub. It actually works out really nicely. You'll obviously need at least four speakers connected to your receiver, two in the front and two in the rear. And that is really all you need to play SQ or QS quadraphonic records. Where can you find such records? We'll get back to that in a minute. Let's first talk about one other quad format, CD4. The SQ and QS quad formats are certainly able to deliver a four-channel listening experience, but they are far from perfect. No matter how good your equipment is, what you end up hearing is never quite the same as what the mix engineer intended. There's just always some information loss that happens in the encoding and decoding processes. Uh, the CD4 format aimed to address that issue by delivering a discrete four channels of sound on a standard-ish LP. How? Eh, it's pretty clever, actually. Uh, in the audible audio range, a CD4 LP will have the sum of the front and rear signals. Then the difference signals are encoded using frequency modulation, aka good old FM, on a 30 kHz carrier signal, which is way beyond the range of human hearing. You then run the audible and inaudible signals through a CD4 demodulator, which brings the FM signal back into the audible range, and then the demodulator combines all those signals together to get you your discrete front and rear channels. Sounds simple enough, right? As is the case with many things, the theoretical doesn't always equate to the practical. That's a nice way of saying that CD4 is a pain in the bum bum. For starters, your turntable will need a specialized stylus like a Shibata or Microline stylus to be able to track the tiny, tiny grooves of that FM signal. The cheapest that you'll find these days is probably the Audio-Technica ATVM95ML. It retails for around 170 US dollars. I own one and can confirm that it works just fine on CD4 records and makes for a decent general purpose stylus otherwise. Uh, if you try to use a regular conical or elliptical stylus on a CD4 record, uh, it'll have trouble tracking those tiny grooves and could do permanent damage to them. People will debate about how much damage you'll really do, but yeah, it's probably not a great idea to chance it. Once those little grooves are destroyed, so too are your hopes of playing back that record in four channels. Or, you know, you could get a laser turntable. If you aren't familiar with those, check out my video on them. The retail pricing for them is a touch higher than $170, though. Once you have the correct stylus for your turntable, you'll need a CD4 demodulator to connect it to. There is no modern equivalent, so you're stuck with vintage gear for this one. This is where things get frustrating, at least for me. I've bought five demodulators off of eBay, and only two of them worked properly. Two others appeared to be working properly, only to find out that they weren't really separating the front and rear channels properly when I ran my calibration LPs through them. Oh, oh, did I mention calibration? Yeah. You'll need to calibrate your demodulator to get the correct overall carrier level and for left and right separation control. It's tricky and time-consuming to get dialed in just right, and you'll have to hope that the FM signal hasn't already been destroyed on your calibration LP. So, yeah. It's decidedly non-trivial stuff. Just like with the SQ and QS quad decoders, you'll need a receiver that can accept multi-channel analog input from your CD4 demodulator. Now, if all this hasn't scared you off yet, and you've acquired all the necessary gear, then the next question you may be asking yourself is, how do I find quadraphonic records? Well, fortunately, there are folks who have taken the time to compile extensive lists of all known quadraphonic recordings. A great starting point is the site surrounddiscography.com, which has a section devoted to quadraphonic recordings. Look through their lists, find an artist that you like, 
make a note of the catalog numbers of the releases that you're interested in. And from there, you can search for those titles on Discogs or eBay. If you're feeling adventurous, you can go straight to the Discogs marketplace and filter for quadraphonic recordings only. At the time of this video, there are over 43,000 quad LPs available. Some of my favorites are Santana's Caravan Sarai. It's not so much that uh, there are all sorts of crazy things happening between the four channels, but it just opens up the sound in what is already an absolutely gorgeous album. Uh, really one of my favorite listening experiences. The Firesign Theater, Everything You Know Is Wrong. This album is entirely spoken word. It's a comedy album, basically. And uh, apart from being funny, if not a bit surreal, uh, the quad effects on this are remarkable. You can tell that this was really very carefully constructed. This quad mix was very carefully constructed. And uh, my goodness, there's so much going on. And uh, yeah, this is a fantastic showpiece for SQ Quad, maybe even one of the best. These two albums by the band Chase, their eponymous debut album, and Pure Music, their third LP. Uh, their debut here uh, was often used in the early days of Quad as a demo LP in store, uh, because the very first few seconds of the album have a uh, solo trumpet kind of doing a, uh, a round-robin thing where it goes from speaker to speaker to speaker to speaker. And it's a great way to test your SQ setup to see if it's working. Uh, but above and beyond that, it's actually... Uh, uh, they're, they're both fantastic albums to listen to and highly recommended. Synergy, Electronic Realizations for Rock Orchestra. Uh, these are encoded in QS, and uh, you won't see anything uh, marked on the, the, the front cover, uh, but if you look carefully on the back, you'll see the words, because we used the QS system in the mixing of this album, the stereo sound is unreal. And you know what else is cool? Let me show you something. Hold on. Let me show you something. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Flora Purim, Stories to Tell. This is encoded in CD4 quadraphonic. Uh, there's a lot of very interesting stuff that's happening in the rear speakers of, of this album. Uh, Ayerto, the percussionist, is very aware of the, his mic placements. And a lot of the time will, you know, like move a shaker from the left rear speaker to the right rear speaker. Uh, it's very, very clever, and there's a lot of really interesting, discrete stuff that's happening, especially with the percussion on this album. One of my favorites. Tomita. Uh, basically, any of his CD4 quad LPs. Uh, I don't have them all, unfortunately. I know, it's sad, but, uh, for example, Snowflakes Are Dancing is a fantastic place to start. Pictures at an exhibition, Firebird, and his album, Cosmos. If you're looking to start a CD4 quad collection, Basically, the Tamita LPs are fantastic places to start. Um, and you'll find them more or less anywhere for very reasonable money. Uh, for example, my uh, second copy of Snowflakes Are Dancing that I've got uh, up on display there, yeah, that cost me 99 cents. In fact, in general, there really isn't that much of a price premium for quad LPs, uh, with the exception being for artists whose names begin with Pink and end with Floyd. Uh, if you can get past the expense and hassle of the hardware, it's not such a bad thing to get into collecting. Lots of inventory and somewhat reasonable prices. If you're browsing in an actual brick and mortar record store or even a thrift store, you're likely to see a quad LP pop up from time to time. Uh, Columbia and its affiliated labels put out uh, very prominent SQ quadraphonic markings on its releases. So you can see the SQ uh, little logo here and very clearly the word quadraphonic up there, kind of hard to miss. CD4 records often have prominent labels reading Quadradisc, uh, and sometimes you'll see the verbiage CD4 channel discrete on them. QS recordings are often harder to spot. Uh, for example, the QS quad recordings on the Impulse label all had this tiny blurb of text on the back of the jacket or somewhere inside a gatefold. And when you think about it, it makes decent sense why they did this. Many people who saw the word quadraphonic on the front of a record assumed that they couldn't play it on a standard turntable with a standard stylus. I have a number of friends who work in record stores, and each and every one of them assumed that SQ and QS quad records needed a special kind of turntable or stylus to play back. By hiding the quad verbiage, they were ensuring that they didn't lose any sales from this kind of confusion. Is it all worth it? Well, I think so, but then again, I am a music addict. Oh, and... No, 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 not now, guys. 
While some quad LPs are nothing to write home about, others reveal things that were either buried or perhaps even missing from their original stereo mixes. It can breathe new life into a record that you've been listening to for years. For me, it's been well worth the hassle of getting the right gear and tracking down quad albums. Before I go, here are a few other points. Number one, if you run non-quad recordings through a QS or SQ decoder, the world will not blow up. In fact, I do nearly all of my listening through my surround master, regardless of whether or not it's a quad LP. I highly recommend it, especially if you have a surround master or a QS decoder. SQ decoders don't do quite as well on non-quad material, but it's still worth some experimentation. Similarly, you can play QS quad records on an SQ decoder, and you can play SQ quad records on a QS decoder. It won't sound quite like it was supposed to, but you'll still get some interesting separation between the front and rear speakers. Number two, there are quad recordings on CD and even on some online streaming services. Uh, for example, the eponymous debut album by Chase and Don Sebesky's Giant Box album are both encoded in SQ Quadraphonic on CD and on most major streaming services. And a whole bunch of stuff from the Impulse label in the early 1970s was only ever mixed in QS Quad so the CD re-releases are also in quad. And uh, also, Synergy's Electronic Realizations for Rock Orchestra was only ever issued in quad, and you can find it for download on all the best high-resolution music sites for a fantastic quad experience. Number three, there is software that can decode SQ and QS quad and can even demodulate CD4 quad recordings. If you're a Mac user, there's a great piece of software called Stereo Lab by P-Spatial Audio that can handle all three. Uh, I personally use it for CD4 recordings, and the results are nearly identical to what I get from my hardware demodulators with a fraction of the hassle. Uh, for PC users, there are scripts written for older versions of Adobe Audition that will attempt to decode SQ and QS quad recordings. I've used them before. They are cumbersome, convoluted, and I'm not convinced that they're particularly accurate. However, if you are bold and daring, you are welcome to give them a try. They're free, so the only thing it will cost you is your time. Do some searching on the quadraphonicquad.com forums, and good luck. Do you guys have experience with quadraphonic records? If so, let me know about it in the comments below, or pop on over to my Discord server, link in the description, and we can continue the conversation over there. Thank you all so much for watching. Please caress the subscribe button and bell icon, and please follow me on Twitch at twitch.tv slash jerfothemusicaddict for music live streams four days a week. Until next time, bye-bye.